What's up, guys, and welcome to episode two of the Dapper 8 podcast. Today, we'll get started with some big news from some classic NFT projects. We'll move on to some massive partnerships, maybe some of the biggest the crypto's ever seen. We'll talk about some updates on the recent hacks. We'll brush on some lawsuits, and then we'll finish up with some global politics to keep you all updated worldwide. Soria, you want to get us started? For sure, man. So as of recording this episode, Bitcoin has traded at around a sub 20,000 range for almost three, four months. So it's clear that we're in extreme bearish sentiment. But even amidst this bear market, one collection stands out, and that's none other than CryptoPunks. So CryptoPunks NFT number 2924 sold for $4.5 million just two days ago. Isn't that amazing? That's, that's, that's absolutely ridiculous. This also makes me extremely optimistic. I'm so bullish on NFTs after hearing this because it's CryptoPunks, one of the first, one of the most classic NFTs. Not one of these NFTs that comes out talking about new technology they don't have yet. It's CryptoPunks. So the fact that someone's willing to pay this much for it shows that people are bullish for the NFT market as a whole and it makes me hopeful. But I do wonder one thing, why now? Yeah, so, um, so yeah, what, what makes this um, NFT special is that in the CryptoPunk set, which is 10,000 NFTs, there's only 24 apes, which you know in crypto, apes are huge, right? Having an ape is awesome. It's like the crypto mascot. So there's only 24 apes and the rest are humans. So um, yeah, most of these apes are actually locked up in staking vaults and in time lock contracts. So whenever one comes to market, it's highly sought after. So this account that bought it actually hasn't traded any crypto in the past two, three years. And this is the first transaction they're making in over 2000 days. So it's a highly, highly calculated move, which of course it has to be considering just the royalties on this trade is almost half a million dollars, man. Yeah, that's ridiculous. And it also reminds me last week, we talked about D God setting the royalties to 0%. So if CryptoPunks had set theirs to 0%, like we were talking, we don't think how that's going to become the trend. They would have just missed out on almost $500,000. That's ridiculous. That's why I can't see the 0% royalties actually becoming a big thing. And also imagine how much um, money D Gods gave up in the future, like future potential income by just setting it to 0% right now. So we'll have to see how their experiment turns out, honestly. But without wasting too yeah. much time on this topic, you were telling me about how Google partnered up with Coinbase. That was mind blowing. You want to tell me more about that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So there are actually a lot of huge partnerships this week. So we'll get started on that with Google and Coinbase. So what they did is now they're letting through Google Cloud services, you'll be able to pay for these services with Coinbase. So you'll be able to use crypto to pay for your cloud hosting services. And this is just really important because it makes me wonder when are other areas of Google Pay going to start supporting cryptocurrencies? Because I think this would be a really good way for Google to start because they have a specific partnership with Coinbase already on one of their platforms so they can easily put that into other aspects of Google Pay. What do you think about that? I wonder why Google chose Coinbase because like exchanges like Binance are like 20 times bigger. Do you know why Google might have chosen Coinbase? I think it's just because they were like the first exchange in the United States that very closely clung to crypto laws. Like they're the first ones, I think, or one of the first ones that let you collect your tax information at the end of the year just from your account. So they've always been very crypto law abiding. So I think that makes them the safest choice, even if they're not the biggest. Also, we're going to discuss this later, but I think regulations, honestly, the key out of this bear market. I completely agree, but that's going to be a huge topic later. So let's not jump into that with both feet quite yet. For sure, man. You were also telling me about another partnership. Was that um, Meta with somebody? Meta has been making a lot of moves. So I just want to mention, since we were just talking about Coinbase, Meta and Coinbase already have a partnership. So in the metaverse, you'll be able to spend crypto, which, I mean, I would hope. But then... Um, Meta also made a partnership with Microsoft. So they're doing this to implement Office 365 applications into their metaverse. So this kind of goes along with what Meta has been trying to do of making their metaverse an enterprise solution instead of like games as me and you have always known it as and what most of the people think of the metaverse as. But this means you'll be able to use Microsoft Teams, PowerPoint, Excel, Word, etc., all inside of the metaverse. So it's like they're trying to bring companies together in a virtual space. So I think that one's really, really cool, especially just because Microsoft and Meta, that's a huge partnership. 
I also think uh, it's just interesting to think that one day people will work in the metaverse. Like right now, that thought seems like kind of out of the box or crazy. But you got to think, just in 1999, um, headlines came out saying within 20 years, half the population is going to be working on the internet. And back then, that sounded crazy because everyone had like, most people had like blue collar jobs and stuff. And um, that transition of actually in 20 years, most people started working on the internet or their jobs involved internet in some sort of way. Um, it just goes to show that, yeah, maybe in 20 years, everyone might be working in the metaverse. So this is a huge play by Microsoft, I think. Guaranteed. So far, I know it's been a little bit of a rocky road for them changing it to an enterprise solution. Because first of all, if you ask a lot of people in the crypto space or in the NFT space, when they hear metaverse, they don't think, oh yeah, that's where I go to work. They think that's where I play some virtual reality game or do some social activity or something like that. So I think what Zuckerberg is going for here is like completely different than what most people are expecting. But he's doubled down on it with like 12 or 13 billion dollars. So clearly he agrees or thinks that this will be a big thing. But since we talked about them enough already, now jumping back for a second to last week, Visa has made even more partnerships. So last week we had two partnerships with Visa, one allowing people to earn points with their debit card purchases, and one just allowing people to spend crypto from their FTX account through their debit card. Well, this week they made a partnership with JP Morgan. Oh wow. Which, yeah, so Chase and Visa are now working together, and what they're doing is they're sort of creating an authentication solution. For any people. for any international viewers that don't know, JP Morgan Chase is the number one bank in the United States. Yeah, it's absolutely huge. And so basically what they did is Visa had B2B Connect and Chase had Link, which I'm not sure, I might have gotten those mixed up, I don't think I did, but it's possible. Essentially what they did is they came together to create an authentication system that they've started to call confirm which like it sounds like it confirms who you're sending money to for financial institutions so before they make a large payment they can see who owns the wallet and confirm that they're actually making the right transaction so this brings a lot more security to just cryptocurrency payments as a whole what do you think this has to offer for the industry honestly i think this is huge because for institutions, right, it's not like we're sending over one soul or like one Bitcoin, right? They're sending over millions, if not billions overnight, literally overnight. Um, so, yeah, because it's such a huge amount, I think without things like this already existing, banks wouldn't even consider using crypto as an option. So I think this is like the first step to get banks to start accepting crypto more and making it more safe. So I think it's a key part of um, mass adoption of crypto. I completely agree. I think it's absolutely crucial, especially right now we're in this bear market. And this actually gives us a little bit of an easy jump to the regulatory things we were talking about before that we believe will bring us out of this bearish cycle. So once financial institutions have both the means to transfer this money safely with the new solution from Chase and Visa, then they will be able to have more trust in the system. And once regulations are set up, then they know they can do it legally. So I think this is a huge turning point. These working together, even though, I would just like to point out, regulations would probably focus on stable coins first. Yeah, for sure. There's that um, Universal Stablecoin Regulation Act. That's probably what's gonna get passed first. That's what people are speculating. Yeah, I completely agree. But I'm just trying to think. If this, if the next step is regulation, this would be primarily regulation in the US, right? because that's just what everyone's looking to the US before they start making their own laws for sure. So everyone's looking to see what the US does before they set their own laws cuz honestly um for other countries it, it is the USD tether right at the end of the day. So um the US has to decide first for sure. Yeah, also um one thing I found interesting was um the kind of the predicament versus the um the west side of the world and the east side of the world because in countries like philippines right um in the united states the banking sector is so strong we have extreme faith in it right but in countries like the philippines the banking sector is not that strong and about 70 percent of their adult population chooses not to have a bank account so for these people they're actually looking to crypto and usd tethers as a store of value and a safeguard so it's actually interesting how new and developing countries um crypto even though it's extremely volatile is considered safer than their native currency what do you think of that? Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? I think it's honestly like, yeah, that part's just, again, mind blowing. I know I've used that term a lot today, but it also reminds me of like what people did in Russia. 
after these traditional um, digital payment systems were closed from sanctions, almost everyone there switched over to cryptocurrency wallets. At one point in Eastern Europe, 18% of all transactions were considered illicit. And now what we talked about last week was they're now shutting down cryptocurrency wallets that they know are located in Russia. So they're taking away what their last resort for a payment system was. And I'm really wondering what that'll result in, but I don't want to get political. Yep. Something similar to that that rung a bell in my head is while the United States government was investigating USD tethers, um, they also started looking into DeFi. And what they found out was 25% of all white papers were cloned or forked off the same white paper. So that means 25% of all crypto white papers are identical. They're in their roadmap and everything. So it's literally just a Ponzi scheme. 25% of them are considered Ponzi schemes. Yeah, I remember you were also saying, I don't remember when you told me this, but it was like the amount of crypto scams. And of 600% scams in the months. past year. 600% increase. That brings me back to DeFi. You know, when there was... It, it, it is the time of DeFi too, because the year for this statistic is between 2020 and 2021. So between 2020 and 2021, crypto scams shot up by 600%. It was in the same study done by the US government. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think... I think... NFTs are now seeing the same thing that DeFi did. People just realized I can make them just this easy. I can pump out a JPEG and I can copy the same white paper. Just like everyone in DeFi was like, I'm gonna clone Pancake Swap and see how much I can make. You know, set our emission rates to like a million and hope for the best. Yeah, I think I think as the supply of these false projects increase compared to the genuine actors out there, that's when the whole market or bubble pops. It's when the number of like fake actors increases like this. Yeah, it's just when the trust is lost, I would say. So not wasting too much time around this topic, but moving on to the next one. Um, so an NFT inf influencer named VFX was just hacked for about $1.5 million worth of NFTs. So he lost both Board Ape Yacht Club, Mutant Ape Yacht Club, and even Doodles NFTs. And the odd thing about this hack is usually when a hack happens, people on Twitter come together and support the person. They try to investigate on chain and help him out. But literally almost every single person was saying this is karma this guy should have got hacked and that's mainly because this vfx guy on twitter is um known for promoting like rug project he's promoted around 20 rugs so um because of just that fact people are like this is karma he deserved it he had it coming <laughs> yeah i honestly if you're that much of a sellout i can't say i feel too much pity chances are he made more than a million dollars because Knowing, being in this industry and knowing how much some of these influencers make, they can easily make over a million dollars from shilling these projects. Yeah, definitely. I think I saw a tweet from him actually that was like, guys, help me. They stole my apes and they just sold this one, help me. And then someone in the comments was like, you no longer own it. You have to remove it as your profile picture now. It's just <laughs> no pity whatsoever. <laughs> Everyone's just trying to slap him while he's down. I the NFT com Something community is very serious about you removing your profile picture if you don't own that NFT. And then everyone else just makes fun of it, like screenshotted this JPEG, got him, like, yep, that's how it works. Sounds about right. Exactly how it works. All right, moving on to our next topic for today. Have you heard about Christie's, an auction house in the United States? I remember the name sounds familiar. Mm -hmm. So basically, Christie's is known for auctioning paintings by like Picasso, Michelangelo, Leonardo, like famous, famous artists. And at the same auction house was about a year ago when Beeple's NFT sold for $69 million. But one thing I want to point out is when Beeple's Human One NFT sold for like a whopping almost $70 million, um, that NFT actually comes with like a 10 foot digital screen and it's a physical NFT. So um, it's it's not really, it's groundbreaking for sure because the physical NFT accompanied with the real on-chain um, NFT. But the thing is, because it's a physical good, um, it's not considered like 100% NFT, right? The value of it is actually having that physical good in your house to display. So what's interesting now is Christie's started Christie's 3.0, which is exclusively for NFTs. So they started an online website, which is an auction house just for Ethereum NFTs. What do you think? That's huge. That's I huge, that's right? Massive, especially Dude, this is the same This is the same auction house that sold Picasso paintings, now selling Board API Club NFTs on the regular on their website. If someone that big, if an auction house that big sees long-term value in selling NFTs on a marketplace, I think they're gonna stick around. If they see long-term value enough to build the infrastructure of that marketplace, that's a huge bullish sentiment for NFTs to come out of this bear market. 
Is this already live? Like, could I list an NFT? Not that I have one that valuable, but... No, so they're actually building it right now. Um, the website's not live. I tried to go on there. It's not live yet. But I assume it'll be live soon since there's headlines all over the place about it. That's crazy. I love it. I, and moving on... Big names. Yeah. Sorry, I was going to say, like, big names getting into the blockchain. Have you heard of NXYZ or NYXZ? Which one is it? Do you no, I haven't heard. NXYZ, I think. It was made by that one Google executive. No, I, but I, it was I a. Know. It's a. He was a previous Google executive, and he was the head of ads. And he started his own company to scour blockchains and provide information to developers in real time. Oh, this rings a bell. This this has to do with, like with Web three indexing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an indexing software. I heard they already got like forty million from VCs, which of course, with the numbers we hear lately, that's not that much. But it was someone like was a big part of Google, and then they left to make something to index blockchains. Like, the big people are seeing the potential in this space. It also makes me wonder what the IRS is gonna be able to do with that, even though it's made for developers. I think like indexing Web3 um, is like the first step before creating Web3 ETFs. So like last year, we saw the creation of a Bitcoin ETF, and now Bitcoin is just traded on the uh, New York Stock Exchange. Um, just like that, um, to see Web3 being traded on the New York Stock Exchange, um, not as individual company, right? Just Web3 as a collective like pool of companies uh, to be traded on the um, stock exchange. We need this indexing to happen right before the ETF gets created. So I think this is a perfect lead into creating Web3 ETF. So I think that's huge because that means a lot of money starting to pour into this ecosystem. If Web3 ETFs are created, a lot of money will get started pouring into this ecosystem. Yeah, I completely agree. But before we get sidetracked on this, you want to talk about our most recent hack? Yeah, yeah, which one? Is that the Binance one or the... No, well, there is news on the Binance one, but I'm going to start out with FTX. So FTX recently got hacked and essentially they had something on their blockchain that it's like there are no gas fees or something. So let people mint or let people like waste gas fees. I don't know exactly how it worked, but they were able to mint tokens for free. They made like a million of them, but they could only withdraw some. So the total losses were like... I think a hundred thousand so dollars. Oh, that's nothing Binance. compared to the Binance hack. Yeah, no, no, no. It's nothing. It's kind of minor, honestly. So, um, honestly, with a hundred thousand dollar hack, they actually lose more money from the word of the hack spreading out and that bad like <laughs> marketing vibe. Yeah, than the hacker the hack only got like seventy-seven k out of it. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if I'd call that a successful hack after going after FTX. But apparently, this vulnerability last time I checked hadn't been patched. Like. Yeah, so it's like people can still do it. I know they put some safeguard in, but it hasn't been officially patched yet. So that's kind of it's kind of interesting. But the real hack, Binance, $100 million hack, they actually released a hard fork, I think it was a few days ago, that will get rid of the vulnerabilities in their system, which let people hack it. And I'm trying to remember like exactly what it is, like what exactly they did to it. Something similar uh, on Solana, though, is uh, did you hear the invention of an on-chain mechanism to get back all like lost gas fees? Like, so apparently the Solana blockchain, each time you make a transaction, opens up a new account um, under that transaction. Like if each time you interact with a brand new wallet, it opens up a new account or each time you mint um, an NFT, it opens up a new account. And in each of these accounts, there's a few like 0.0001 or 0.002 Solana left over after the transaction is completed. So some kids out of nowhere discovered a website where you can actually go and sweep all these unclaimed Solana. And I don't know if it's legit or not, but I tried it with one of my burner wallets and they definitely deposit Solana back into your account. But I've never heard of this before. I just saw it coming out this week. That's, it's so interesting. Cause when I hear about that, I would think wallet drain, but if you tried it and they actually gave you the Solana, I'm wondering like- I'm, I'm speculating if there's a future wallet drain when you add more money into your account or when more people like start using that account regularly, maybe in a month they might wallet drain or something. But the, the founders like of this thing is undoxed. But it works though, it seems to work. So it's kind of interesting, honestly. That is kind of interesting. People always make crazy new stuff. I know, right? So without further ado, moving on to our last topic of the day before we get into the politics section. Um, so Board Ape Yacht Club is actually put under investigation by the SEC for their ape token. So the ape coin actually dropped 10% after this news came out. 
And what the SEC is doing is they're going to apply the Howey test, which is a test to test if something is a security or not, um, for the ApeCoin to test whether Board Ape Yacht Club issued securities without the SEC's regulation. So if this is true, which most likely it will be, um, we can expect a drop in prices of Bake NFTs and also the ApeCoin once more. Um, but yeah, what do you think about crypto regulation and what do you think about these NFT projects just making tokens and are they securities in your opinion? Um, most of them, I honestly think would qualify as securities. It's just right now, it's just such a wasteland. Well, not a wasteland. It's just kind of a shit show, pardon my French. But there are just people doing so many things and so many projects that just don't care. Like, there's, the regulations are not clear at all, so people ignore them. But I think most of them, yeah, they are securities. Because you can literally sell it. Like, you can sell the token for real money. What? I mean, I can't see them winning that case. So diving a little bit more into this, according to the SEC, the way they classify something as a security is applying this four part Howey test. And the four parts of this test is it has to be an investment of money in a common enterprise with the expectation of profit to be derived from the effort of others. So that's the exact wordings from their website of how the Howey test is conducted. And now let's put this four step Howey test into one sentence. Basically what it's saying is, a stock is something where you put money in expectation of profit from someone else doing the work. And this seems to be the case in most NFT projects, right? So yeah, yeah honestly, um, we'll see how regulation plays out because I think this is going to affect far more than Board API Club. And I think Board oh, API yeah, Club definitely. is leading this because they're the number one NFT. Yeah, I completely agree. They just went after the big dog first, but there's so many projects like this. So I think this could be the start to just extremely like an attack of regulation on the US government on um, American NFTs because they haven't really done much yet. Thank you guys for tuning in for the second episode of the Dapper 8 podcast. We'll see you next week with new news on Web3, NFTs, and crypto.